Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's CryUAM Current Practices webinar. You're joining the three national centers established by the NIH Common Fund Transformative High Resolution Cryo Electron Microscopy Program. My name is Christina Zemanyi. I'm a scientist and training liaison at the National Center for CryUAM Access and Training, NCCAT. I'm joined today by my colleague here at NCCAT, Ed Eng. Um, also, Amy Liu and Michael Schmidt from the Stanford Slack CryOEM Center, S2C2, and um, Harry Scott from the Pacific Northwest CryOEM Center, and uh, Lauren Hales-Beck from uh, PNCC may also be joining us in, in a minute as well, if you see her uh, pop in. Uh, PNCC has invited today's speaker, Zhang Ruan, and Harry will introduce him properly uh, after my colleagues from each of the centers give a quick overview and update on the CryOEM resources we offer at no cost to the research community. For anyone who hasn't attended our webinar series before, CryOEM Current Practices is an ongoing event that we host the last Thursday of every month um, at this same time. And we highlight particularly the methods that researchers are using to obtain an sorry, obtain and interpret the data they can collect at the national centers. And uh, next month, S2C2 is hosting uh, Christopher Koo from the Rosenzweig Lab at Northwestern University, who will be presenting cryoEM studies of a methane oxidizing enzyme in a lipid bilayer. Um, so do save the date now for our future talks. Uh, we are recording today's talk, and you can find uh, the recording along with those from past talks on the events page at cryoemcenters.org, uh, where you can also find registration links for future talks and general information about the larger NIH Common Fund cryoEM program. A couple of final logistics before we get started. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send questions um, at any point during the talk, and you can also upvote other questions you see there. If you have questions directed to logistics um, or access at the centers, our panelists here will respond to them directly in that Q&A box, and we'll save questions for Chang uh, for the end of his talk. And um, with that, I will turn over to our center representatives and uh, Amy is going to lead off. Hello, my name is Amy Liu, one of the staff members from Stanford Slack Cryo Center or S2C2. In our center, we are harboring three Titan Cryos and one Talos Arctica for conducting high resolution data collection and training. Currently, we are upgrading one of our Cryos with the new uh, energy filter from some official scientific. We welcome all levels of cryoEM researchers. So if you are interested in collecting high resolution data or starting new cryoEM projects, please feel free to visit our website or contact us directly for more information. We look forward to working with you. Thank you, Amy. And I'll turn over next to Ed. Hi, my name is Ed. I'm here at NCCAT in New York. We have two main flavors of access. One is our embedded cross-training program. We are accepting users on site for this program. And this month we've had trainees on site as well as workshops. So if you wanna spend a week, a month or a semester with us, please contact us for more. The other flavor of access is instrument access. We have four dedicated Titan Creos instruments. We are currently upgrading our chameleon to the commercialized version. So you might notice that category is blocked out but it'll be open by next proposal cycle. So find out more at ncat.nyspc.org and see you here soon. Thank you, Ed. And Harry, turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Harry Scott, and I'm a scientific point of contact at the Pacific Northwest Cryo-EM Center. Our facility offers one proposal type for both single particle analysis and tomography projects. This proposal allows up to 480 hours of imaging time per year and is valid for up to two years. At PNCC, we accept applications on a monthly basis. Each approved proposal is designated a SPOC to help with imaging and sample optimization. PNCC has five microscopes, so one Arctica with a K3, a Creos with a Falcon 3 and a K3. We've got two Creoses with Falcon 3 and a BioQuantum K3, and one Creos that has recently been upgraded. So it's got a Falcon 4 and a BioContin K3, and it's recently undergone the upgrades to allow for fringe-free imaging. 
For sample pre preparation, we have a VitroBot, a Leica GP2, and a VitroJet, which the VitroJet is undergoing validation and will soon be available to our users. And PNCC is currently offering one-on-one -on -one remote training and small molecule, or sorry, small remote workshops. When And when COVID restrictions are relaxed and we can have visitors on site again, we plan to offer small on-site workshops covering microscope operation and sample preparation. So you can apply on our website today. Thank you, Harry. And I'll turn it right back to you again to introduce today's speaker. Yeah, yeah. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce a very talented postdoc. His name is Dr. Zhang, Zheng Ruan from the lab of Dr. Juan Du and Dr. Wei Lu at the Van Andel Institute in Michigan. He's got a very interesting talk for us today. He's going to outline his work with um, protein channels of various different sizes and the hurdles he's had to overcome to solve the structures. So without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Zheng Ruan. Okay, um, um, let me share my screen. Okay, oh, um, are people to see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, um, so, um, good morning, everyone. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank Harry and Lauren for their kind uh, invitation and allow me to present here. Um, today, I'm going to share my recent work on studying three membrane channels and share some of my uh, the lessons that I learned uh, along the way. Uh, during my past uh, several years in Dr. Juan and Wei's lab, uh, I was working on understanding the structure of three membrane channel proteins, including the TRIPM5 channel, the panexin 1 channel and the proton activated chloride channel. Um, the TRIPM5 channel has a molecular weight about 530 kV as a tetramer and it plays a critical role in taste sensation. The panexin 1 channel is a large core ATP release channel uh, with seven fold symmetry. Uh, the channel complex has a molecular weight about 340 kV. Uh, and the PAC channel is a recently discovered cellular pH sensor. Uh, it, only, it is only about 120 kD as a trimeric complex. So these channel proteins possess different biochemical property, properties and each has distinct challenges for me to get uh, high resolution structures. So in this talk, I will not discuss the biological aspect of these channels, um, but you are welcome to read the papers to get to know more about their function. So in the talk, I will discuss uh, several aspects of uh, membrane protein sample preparation, including the impact of the GFP tag, uh, how, how it affects the grid quality. And I will also discuss um, uh, how I choose between detergent and a nanodisc sample for cryo-EM analysis. And afterward, I will go through several example data sets of each of the three protein and share my uh, data processing strategies. Uh, as a brief introduction, uh, for membrane protein research, um, uh, establishing the optimal conditions for protein extraction is extremely important for the success of CryoEM applications. So our lab uses the fluorescence size exclusion chromatography based method for efficient construct screening. Um, the method was initially designed to uh, identify conditions suitable for membrane protein crystallography but it turns out to be equally powerful for cryo-EM analysis. Uh, specifically, uh, our protein expression vector contains the gene of interest, uh, followed by uh, a protease cutting site and a GFP molecule uh, and a um, um, protein purification tag. Uh, we primarily use mammalian cells for protein expression in the lab, but the same principle can be used for other expression systems as well. So after the protein extraction, uh, we um, solubilized uh, a protein with different detergent to extract the membrane protein. And then we pass the sample through a size exclusion column and monitor the GFP sig uh, fluorescent signal. So this method allows us to rapidly screen many different conditions and construct in a relatively short period of time without the need to actually purify the protein. Thus increasing the success rate and also uh, um, for the subsequent CryoEM applications. 
So here I just uh, showed an example of fluorescent science exclusion chromatography trace uh, of different um, detergent screening. Um, when looking at the FACC data, uh, we're primarily concerned about the peak shape in terms of its position and how symmetric it is. Uh, and in addition, we also prefer to find the detergent with maximum protein extraction efficiency. So as can be seen from the example figure here, uh, I show three different detergent extraction. The MNGCHS uh, doesn't solubilize the protein very well uh, uh, compared to the other two detergent. And uh, in addition, uh, the digitonin doesn't uh, extract the protein as much as the GDN detergent. So based on this, uh, we would prefer, in this example, we would prefer to use um, GDN detergent for uh, protein extraction. Although the, um, the GFP tag is very useful during the screening stage, uh, sometimes it could cause problems when imaging the protein sample uh, with a GFP tag. Uh, therefore, our construct contains a protease cutting site uh, for GFP removal. Uh, in my experiences, uh, whether it is necessary to remove GFP uh, is protein dependent. So on the right, I showed you an example 2D of the trip M5 protein that I'm working on, in which uh, we can see that there's a little fuzzy uh, signal um, appears uh, in the soluble part of the protein. Uh, although it seems that this could contribute negatively to the particle quality, uh, the TRIPM5 protein doesn't seem to be affected by the presence of GFP. So in the final 3D reconstruction, I cannot see the GFP density uh, in the Crow-EM map. Uh, however, this is not the case for the other two proteins that I've been working on. So on the left, I'm comparing the 2D class averages of connecting channel with and without GFP. So as can be seen from the side view, uh, we can see that the GFP uh, forms a cloudy signal in the intracellular side uh, of the protein. In addition, uh, the top and the down view of the 2D class average is much worse in the Panaxin-1 protein sample with GFP, and the stoichiometry uh, is not obvious um, uh, in, this, in, the, in the GFP tag sample. Therefore, the removal of GFP is very necessary to obtain high-resolution cryo-EM structures for Panaxin-1 protein. Uh, here, I also showed a comparison of the PAC protein with and without GFP. Uh, the flexible GFP signal is shown on the opposite side of the uh, extracellular domain of PAC. So this signal is gone in the um, condition um, in, um, after the GFP removal. Uh, it is also very obvious that the quality of the 2D of PAC GFP sample is much worse than the one without GFP. So therefore, I always remove the GFP tag uh, for preparing cryo-EM grid for connecting and PAC grid. So in this slide, I listed the pros and cons of GFP removal. For proteins that are not affected by the presence uh, of GFP, uh, uh, it, is, um, uh, it will save us both time and resources. Uh, however, uh, for protein samples that are negatively affected by the GFP signal, it is very important to completely cleave the GFP from the protein. Uh, it should be noted that um, some protease may have non-specific activity and could digest uh, the protein at other locations. So if this is the case, then it's probably necessary to use uh, another protease that doesn't exert non-specific uh, cleavage activity on the target protein. Then uh, I will move on to the next topics. Uh, another widely used method to study membrane protein is to reconstitute them from detergent into nanodisc. Um, the principle is relatively simple in which the protein is first solubilized by detergent. Uh, subsequently, the protein will be mixed with a protein called membrane scaffold protein and the lipid molecule uh, and uh, absorption biobeads to facilitate the reconstitution process. So after this procedure, the protein will be encapsulated in a small uh, limpid disk surrounded by the MSP protein, uh, which could then be used for cryo-EM imaging. So it is worth mentioning that we usually supply extra amount of MSP protein and limpid to ensure that all the proteins get reconstituted into the nanodisk. Um, therefore, it is very common to not only get the protein nanodisk complex, but we could also get empty nanodisc. Uh, 
So I usually perform an additional affinity purification step to get rid of the empty nanodisc. Um, this is especially important for small proteins such as PAC, uh, in which um, uh, a simple gel filtration step may not um, clearly separate between the two. Uh, so here I, I showed a uh, two uh, uh, SEC traces of the PAC nanodisc reconstitution experiment. As can be seen, uh, after the uh, IMAC procedure, um, the SEC peak becomes um, a PAC nanodisc sample becomes much more homogeneous and monodispersed. Um, there are also pros and cons of using nanodisc versus detergent conditions. Um, the use of detergent is simple and straightforward because it's basically a prerequisite for the nanodisc experiment. Uh, however, for freezing cryo-EM grid, it is usually um, requires a very high protein concentration uh, because the presence of the detergent in the buffer. In addition, the detergent could also form extra micelle on the grid, uh, introducing significant background noise and pose challenges for subsequent data processing. The use of nanodex is beneficial in several aspects. Uh, first, the protein is now in a limpid environment, uh, which is more biologically relevant as opposed to the detergent solubilized condition. Uh, second, the MSP protein comes uh, with different versions that allows um, better control of the disk size. As the membrane protein target may have different number of transmembrane helices, the use of nanodisc will help shape the size of the nanodisc optimal for the protein of interest. Uh, another advantage of using nanodisc is that protein sample can now be treated as soluble protein. Uh, because of this, it generally requires much less uh, sample material for preparing grid. And also uh, without the detergent, the contracts of particle images is usually better than the detergent containing condition. Uh, the downside of using nanodisc is that it requires further optimization and not every protein can be successfully reconstituted, especially for um, non-unstable uh, target. So here I compare the 2D of trip m 5 and a Panaxi-1 channel in detergent and in nanodisc. So in both cases, I obtained the sub uh, four angstrom structures uh, for them. Uh, and I'm not able to see any uh, differences between the detergent and none of these conditions. So because none of this sample preparation takes additional effort and resources, uh, I decided to primarily focus on studying these two proteins uh, in detergent. Um, this is not the case for the PAC protein uh, in which the none of this sample offers better 2D uh, and the 3D reconstruction. Uh, here we can see that uh, um, the detergent micelle, uh, this is in GDM detergent, it's um, very big and it allows a large flexibility of the PAC protein. And more importantly, in the 3D reconstruction of the PAC protein in GDM detergent, I'm not able to see uh, transmembrane helices. So therefore, I'm primarily focused on using nanodisc to solve the structure of PAC. Uh, and another tip that I find particularly useful is to add uh, 0.5 millimolar fluorinated octal melting sulfide or foam prior to the grid freezing. Uh, foam is a type of uh, fluorinated surfactant unable to solubilize protein by itself. And adding a sub uh, CMC level uh, of foam will further ensure that the integrity of PAC um, nanodisc sample. Uh, additionally, um, um, the adding of foam can significantly improve the grid, qual uh, the grid quality and the particles uh, during the vitrification process. So here, as can be seen from the conditions without foam, the grid tends to look noisy with small uh, dot-like particles, especially at a thin ice area. And the micrograph um, looks uh, much better at the foam uh, containing condition and the particles look more intact. Um, so next, I will talk about the data processing strategies. Uh, I will use the trip M5 uh, as an example to demonstrate the typical data processing workflow that I'm currently using. Uh, I will also show you two examples of uh, Panaxin 1 and PAC data set, uh, both having their unique challenges, uh, such as sample heterogeneity and a small target with limited features, and how I address those challenges. So the TRIP-M5 data processing procedure is 
uh, currently our standard workflow in which uh, we tightly integrate uh, several programs. Uh, so after the standard data pre-processing, um, we use this um, both the traditional template-based particle picking method, um, uh, as well as the uh, neural network-based particle picking method. So we clean up the particles independently and combine them um, after removing the duplicated particles within a certain radius cutoff. Um, so the idea here is to get as many particles picked as possible, uh, because if a particle is not picked initially, then it will never contribute to the final reconstruction. So here I quantify the statistics um, of one of my data set um, uh, after a particle cleanup uh, from each of these two um, picking algorithm. Uh, as we can see that um, although there is a significant overlap, um, I do get a significantly more particles by, by using um, both uh, picking uh, method. Uh, so during the particle cleanup stage, uh, I used um, CryoSpark to remove junk particles. Um, this is very beneficial because uh, CryoSpark is much faster than Reliant and it did a very good job in terms of separating good and bad particles. Uh, I usually use both 2D and 3D, uh, 2D classification and the 3D heterogeneous refinement job for these purposes. Um, the use of 2D is a traditional method to sort out the junk particles. However, it may uh, miss real views. It might be difficult um, um, to form a nice uh, average with the rest of the particles. So 3D heterogeneous refinement is more suitable for this purpose. Uh, so in the 3D heterogeneous refinement, I supply a number of bad volumes and one good reference um, um, to help the um, program to classify particles. Uh, and then I combine the um, particles um, and remove the duplicate. In general, the two jobs overlap uh, significantly. Um, uh, but there are always a significant uh, fraction of particles that are only uh, picked by one method. Um, so I generally perform a, a, a perform a union operation to combine the particles and uh, carry them for um, subsequent analysis in Reliant. So using this procedure, the chance of losing nice particles will be much less than uh, just uh, using a single method. For the trip M5 data set, I usually directly refine particles uh, exported from CrowdSpark. Uh, however, for some other data set, sometimes it is beneficial to do another 3D classification. So after the uh, refinement um, in the trip M5, um, um, we notice that the transmembrane domain is subjected to large um, conformational heterogeneity. Uh, therefore, I, I subtract the um, I use a mask to subtract the transmembrane um, domain of um, chip M5 and perform a focused classification without image alignment uh, in this part. Uh, so as can be seen from the classes shown here, uh, many classes have a um, much, for example, this one has a much worse resolution. Some others has a disordered, uh, part, partly disordered transmembrane domain. Uh, this class also has a disordered extracellular loop. Uh, so uh, after this procedure, we choose the nice class and uh, convert them back to the non-subtracted chip uh, M5 particles uh, for, um, for the subsequent 3D refinement. So at this stage, um, the map is usually at sub three angstrom resolution. Uh, so it is my typical procedure to further study the conformational heterogeneity at single subunit level chip M5. So trip M5 is a tetramer. So I usually uh, expand four copies of the particles and subtract a single subunit uh, of the protein. Uh, I then perform uh, 3D classification without uh, image alignment on the single subunit classes to get an uh, idea of, um, uh, about their uh, com uh, subtle conformational changes in the single subunit level. So, uh, so in addition, I can also trace back this single subunit classes to the tetrameric particles to understand the distribution of each uh, class in the context of the tetramer. Uh, this could give us an additional insight in terms of the, for example, the cooperative movement of the single subunit class 
and how they contribute to the overall conformation of the channel. And additionally, sometimes it is also helpful to identify novel conformations by refining a set of um, tetrameric uh, particles that are purely consist of a single uh, subunit class, um, in the, the subunit class in a single conformation. So indeed, uh, so using this strategy, my published work has allowed me to identify two conformations of trip M5 with this team, the calcium binding occupancy. So therefore, uh, this procedure is particularly useful to identify subtle conformational changes that are difficult to be identified by analyzing the protein as a whole. So next, uh, I will talk about another data set of Panexin-1 channel. Uh, so Panexin-1 belongs to the gap junction ion channel superfamily, uh, which are a group of proteins that can establish uh, a channel between two adjacent cells. Uh, so in my study, I identified a glycosylation deficient uh, mutant of Panexin-1, uh, the N255 to amyloid mutant, um, that allows the protein to form a gap, gap junction in vitro. Uh, however, uh, only a small fraction of Panexin-1 particles form the gap junction complex. Uh, so it is thus technically challenging to separate the gap junction and hemi-channel particles apart. So to do this, uh, I first performed a 2D classification. Uh, from the 2D, it is relatively easy to separate the side view and the tilt to the view of gap junction uh, and the hemi-channel particles apart. Uh, however, for the top and down views of the two conditions will look very similar. Um, therefore, uh, I combine the side of the to the view as well as the top down view and rely on the 3D classification to separate the hemichannel and gap junction. So after 3D classification, uh, um, I will run another 2D to confirm that the particles identified by the 3D uh, are indeed um, um, consist of, uh, for example, here, the gap junction particles. I use the same strategy um, to study the hemi um, channel as well. So after confirming that the classification method indeed works um, um, by 2D, uh, I then proceed to uh, 3D refinement to obtain uh, high resolution maps. So lastly, I will talk about the data analysis um, procedure on the PET channel, uh, which is by far the most uh, challenging data set that I've been working on. The PAC protein is about 120 kD, which is relatively small for cryo-EM analysis. Uh, in addition, the protein also lacks very obvious features, especially for the top-down view. Uh, you can see that it's basically a circular shape, uh, making the particle alignment uh, very difficult. So here I will talk about two strategies that I used for PAC data processing. Um, so the data is first um, uh, cleaned up by two rounds 2D classification. Uh, I initially tried um, extensive 3D classification to identify high quality particles. Um, however, I recently found that um, by directly refining the particles from 2D is sometimes more straightforward. Uh, so I will discuss both methods uh, in the next few slides. So the procedure that relies on 3D classification is the one that I used before I have a reference map uh, for the protein because uh, classification um, of PAC tends to be inefficient. Uh, so I will have to do this in an iterative manner. Uh, so here, um, an initial classification with C1 symmetry followed by uh, refinement uh, could uh, give me a moderate uh, resolution map. Uh, but this is enough for me to identify the symmetry of the protein. So in the next step, uh, a classification uh, with uh, C3 symmetry followed by a refinement could help improve the uh, uh, map resolution to 4.6 uh, angstrom. So in the next, I then classify the particle again uh, using C3 symmetry and the low pass the reference map to only seven angstrom uh, which will still preserve the alpha helical information uh, during the 3D classification. So this step uh, allowed me to obtain a particle set that uh, gives a 4.2 angstrom resolution. So at this stage, uh, I'm not able to push the resolution further just by reclassifying particles. So next, I noticed that the extracellular domain of the protein has a much better quality compared to the transmembrane domain. 
I tried a signal subtraction and a focus of a classification on several parts of the PAC protein. And the one that works best is to subtract the extracellular uh, domain and a part of the transmembrane domain close to the extracellular side. Uh, so by uh, performing a focus of a focus of the classification without image alignment on this part. Uh, I'm able to uh, obtain several classes with minor differences in their nominal resolution. Uh, and then by refining them individually, uh, I'm finally able to get a particle set uh, uh, that will allow me to get a reconstruction at 3.6 angstrom. So one uh, key um, parameter that needs to be explored here is the regularization value t. In this case, a t value equals uh, 40 uh, gives me the best result. But re in re reality, exploring different t values is often necessary to obtain the best result. Uh, one more thing that I noticed uh, is that um, subtracting the detergent of my cell, and in this case, the nano disk, um, also, contribute, uh, also can help um, um, reduce um, the noise of the reconstruction. Um, and uh, I'm able to uh, achieve, uh, get a small resolution improvement um, by subtracting the, the my cell signal. So the next strategy is that uh, I used currently um, because um, a good reference model uh, is available. So after 3D um, classification, the particles will um, be used to, uh, for 3D refinement directly. So in this process, I will first refine the particles uh, and optimize the CTF and uh, polish the particle information until no further improvement is seen. And then classify the particles uh, without uh, image uh, alignment. However, uh, here I try to use slightly different T values and only focus on classes that, uh, on the class that give me the best resolution. So here I tried four different T values uh, and then I combine the particle, the particles of the best class uh, uh, and remove the duplicated particles and refine the map. So the final reconstruction is better than any of the individual classification jobs here. Um, the idea behind this procedure is that um, because uh, 3D classification tends to be inefficient for PAC protein and combining good particles identified by various jobs will decrease the chance of losing good particles and therefore can improve the final map uh, resolution. Another way to think about this is that uh, if a particle has never been included in the best class of all four classification jobs, then it's probably a bad particle that it should be removed. So with this uh, particle set in hand, I can further optimize the CTF uh, and motion information and obtain additional improvement uh, on the map quality. Uh, at the end, I would like to also share my recent experiences with a data set collected at BNCC. Uh, so from this data set, I find that uh, um, by only using a subset of movie frames could help improve the map resolution. Uh, for example, the, the data has, uh, the data set has uh, 52 um, frames with a total dose of 50 electrons per n square in total. So after exhausted all the, my options to refine the data, I try to uh, specify a subset of frames during the polishing step. So I tested uh, different ranges by using frame 1 to 40, 1 to 30, and 1 to 20. Uh, and they all result in a small uh, improvement in the map resolution. And furthermore, I found that if I just skip um, the first movie frame, uh, which typically undergoes a large beam induced motion for particles, uh, I can get a uh, further uh, um, improvement in the nominal resolution. So here I plotted the FSC curve comparing the full data set and the movie frame um, 2 to 21 data set. So as can be seen from the FSC curve, uh, uh, um, the, um, the FSC curve of frame 2 to 21 is above the full frame FSC curve over a range of uh, resolutions, uh, suggesting that the improvement uh, is um, probably real. So I will conclude uh, my talk here. Uh, so I discussed the, um, that GFP is beneficial for the screening um, 
of ambient proteins, but may pose an issue for sample preparation. Uh, I discussed my experiences of choosing detergent over nanodisc uh, for crowd EM analysis. And I also shared my strategies for the data processing and how I address uh, different challenges. And I hope this information could be helpful um, for your own project. So in the end, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Jen Wei and the lab members. Uh, the Crown EM core and HPC uh, team at BAI and the PMCC personnel who help um, set up the data collection on my PAC project. Uh, so although most of the data I presented here were collected at uh, our institute, um, uh, we have collected a very nice um, data set with the help of um, Dr. Harry using the microscope at PNCC, um, which will be published in the near future. Um, I also like to thank Lauren and uh, uh, Claude for their uh, assistance and all the staff at the PNCC for their fantastic effort to keep the microscope and facility performing at their best. Uh, in the end, I also like to acknowledge the funding agency that um, support my research. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shang. Uh, I think you're you're missing the loud round of applause that we would be hearing if we were all in a room together. That was that was a, a fantastic uh, and extremely quick tour through a whole lot of work that you've done on those proteins. Um, so we do have a, a, a large number of questions, and um, Mike is actually going to help us moderate through those um, and and give them to you. So uh, we'll feed the questions straight to you. Hi, thanks. Uh, great, great talk, Jane. Um, uh, we will start basically um, chronologically mostly. Uh, our first question uh, is whether a, a question of whether GFP can contribute positively to particle alignment in 2D, or is it usually not helpful? Uh, yeah, I don't. Um, I don't have any samples that. I see improvement of having GFP. Um, the best case is that it doesn't uh, make it worse. Um, I think um, um, the reason is probably because uh, in the construct, uh, we have a relatively long linker uh, between the GFP and the protein. Uh, so that could allow the GFP to be very flexible. Uh, and uh, yeah, so because of that, it, uh, it's, um, yeah, it, I don't think it, it could uh, contribute positively to the sample quality. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what is your experience with different proteases and their efficiency and their nonspecific cleavage? Do you have a favorite protease you're working with? Um, in our lab, in the, the standard construct that we have, uh, we are using thrombin. Um, I think partly because that is commercially available, we can just buy it. Um, but uh, I do have um, experiences where thrombin can cut on other part of my protein. Uh, in that case, I, I try to use the 3C um, protease, which give me the best result. Um, but this is by no means, an, uh, yeah, it's not exhaustive. I think it's, it's protein dependent and uh, need to be tested. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I will honor the upvoted ones uh, and so this one rose because more than one person upvoted it, I guess. What neural network-based particle picking program did you use? Oh, so I used the TOPAS um, um, method. Yeah, that's, that's the one that I currently use. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. All right. All right. Um, and then how did you generate your mask for signal subtraction? That is, did you subtract what you didn't want to see and then uh, and, and do the difference? And then, uh, then what would be left is the part of the object that you did not subtract. Is that how you uh, worked it? Um, so for signal subtraction, usually there are two ways that I use. Um, so usually if I have a atomic model available, uh, I can generate an expected map uh, based on the atomic PDB model, and then I can um, resample a map uh, based on based on the model, and then generate a mask on any part 
of it uh, based on based on that. Uh, and another way to generate a mask for signal subtraction is that uh, using Chimera, we can manually erase um, signals. Um, if we are confident that, for example, this is for sure, this is detergent micelle, we can manually um, erase the signal and then use the remaining signal to generate a mask. So that's um, two different ways of um, generating mask for uh, signal subtraction that I know. So one, so one is uh, atomic model based and the other is map based. Yes. Okay. Um, how do you deal with signal from detergent micelle density? Does it cause any problem in your analysis? Um, so um, I think um, in most cases, um, it is, um, I think it might help during the initial 2D uh, stage uh, because that could be a feature, um, especially for some of my proteins. Um, the side view is probably the most best aligned um, in terms of the 2D. Um, but uh, uh, when you get to high uh, resolution construction, then the micelle could be a problem um, because, um, for example, from my PAC project, um, the the detergent micelle could be very big and that will allow a large degree of freedom uh, for the protein. And that could cause problems for uh, particle alignment. Um, so because of that, in the end, uh, um, it is usually uh, beneficial to subtract the uh, micelle signal and only focus on the protein part and get the um, actual uh, the resolution estimate for the protein. Okay. For um, for the PAC nanodisk data processing, did you particle pick and CTF refine in CryoSpark and then explore to export to Relyon, uh, or was it all in Relyon? Uh, so the initial particle pre-processing, uh, I, I did all of that in um, Relyon, including the motion core and CTF find, and then. Um, then I pick the particles through the third party uh, uh, program uh, and then import the particles into CrowdSpark. And then after I identify the subset of particles that is good, uh, I export those and uh, plug into Reliant for subsequent processing. So the benefit of doing this is, uh, I, um, for, for example, the polishing step, uh, it requires a uh, motion core um, a job in Reliant as the input um, so that I can integrate all that um, together in, um, smoothly. Yeah. Okay, um, a question about why uh, can the fluorinated uh, detergent improve the quality of the cryogenic samples of membrane proteins? <laughs> why? <laughs> Good question. That's a, that's a challenging question to answer. Um, I think the, the, the fluorinated um, surfactant was developed several years ago and uh, it's been used by um, several groups and uh, there are several successful stories for using them. Um, it's just in our hand uh, because we are more um, experienced with membrane protein uh, grid preparation. So the inclusion of the, um, the detergent will fit into our uh, standard workflow much better. Um, and uh, we do notice that uh, um, the particle um, distribution and the, um, and the integrity of the proteins looks better. Um, but we don't have very clear explanation as to why um, at least the my nanodisc sample um, doesn't look very good uh, without adding the surfactant. Uh, one possible reason could be that we know that um, the protein tends to denature at uh, our water interface. Uh, and, uh, and if the eye sickness is not optimal, um, then that could contribute to the to the damage of the particle in the cryo EM grid. And the addition of the surfactant could help uh, at least partially uh, address um, this issue. Thank you. Uh, when, you see, when you say you need higher concentration for detergent solubilized sample compared to nanodisks, uh, what is the reason behind that? Um, can you repeat the question? Okay. Again? When you say you need higher concentration for detergent solubilized samples compared to nanodisks. 
and whether oh. okay whether that was true uh what is the reason behind it if if that's true yeah usually for a soluble protein it, um yeah for membrane protein the big problem is that the protein do not um um doesn't tend to fall into the hole of the grid um, um that's our experience um because of that we tend to use a very high concentration of um, proteins um, um, and then force the proteins to get into the hole. Um, but for soluble proteins, um, uh, usually the, the, the concentration of the protein requirement is, is much less. Um, in our experience, maybe 0.5 mg per ml to 1 mg per ml is usually uh, enough to get a nice um, particle density uh, if we do not include uh, detergent in the buffer. Yeah, so, but I don't have an explanation why that. That's just an observation that, uh, yeah, we typically okay. see. Okay, how do you perform and optimize the extraction of the proteins from the mammalian expression systems? Um, how, how do you get them out of the, out of the mammalian cells? <laughs> oh. Um, for mammalian cells, it's relatively simple because we don't have cell wall, uh, and so so we just harvest the cells and then um, and then um, mix the cells with the buffer of favorite and detergent. Different, we, of course, we screen different detergent, uh, and then we check the FSEC uh, profile to determine uh, which one can give us the best um, protein extraction result. Okay, how much cell culture is generally needed for one sample prep for your channel proteins? That is, you know, <laughs> how, yeah, much, so that's, how much do yeah. you guys use? Yeah, so that's really depends on the expression level. Uh, for some proteins that expresses very well, for example, the um, Panax1 protein, uh, its extraction is extraordinary. So usually uh, uh, 200 ml culture is enough um, for me to make several uh, grid. Um, but for some other proteins like pack protein, in my hand, um, the expression level is very low. Um, so I usually need at least two flasks, so 1.6 liter of cells to, to get just enough proteins for making grid. Um, yeah, so that's really depend on the, the expression level. Mm -hmm. uh, what bad models did you use as bait for picking bad particles in 3D classification? Or did you, uh, I guess? what? What bad models did you use? Uh, for particle picking? For for excluding, I guess, for getting rid of bad particles yeah. in the 3D class. So that can be anything that looks um, very different from the the yeah the, the one that you would expect. Um, so we usually generate that by doing an, an initial um, reconstruction in CrowdSpark. Uh, so that um, usually you will get um, one good one and uh, several bad one. Uh, so, but uh, a, a initial reconstruction usually takes quite some time. So you can. So in my case, I usually save those bad one and uh, use those for subsequent cross spark use. So that's going to save some time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when removing frames to improve your resolution, how do your conclusions relate to the motion correction plots? That is, can you look at the plots and decide which fra frames to remove? Yes, uh, I think that's a good point. Uh, that's something I can definitely explore. Um, um, because uh, I, I noticed that the, the beam induced motion is actually first several frames, not just the first a single frame. Um, so, so, so that, that's something I have never, I haven't tested, um, but it could definitely be something that I can explore. And another thing that maybe also worth optimizing because in, in this process, I actually realigned particles. So basically when I polishing a specific sub frames range and, and then I use a 3D refinement job to, to refine the particles. Um, but it might be also a good, good idea to just do, recon, do a reconstruction without um, uh, particle alignment, uh, which will uh, better tell uh, the quality of those frames. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I think you you approached this in your in your talk, but what is the range of T values that you recommend trying? Um, the largest T value I tried is around um, 
maybe 50, that's the largest. So usually it's in the range of eight to 50, um, but it really depends on the size of the, of the area that you want to classify. So if you want to classify a really small um, part of, the, of your protein, then a high T value is usually necessary. And uh, if the area is big, then uh, we can use a relatively um, smaller T value. And the one way to judge um, whether uh, um, you are subjected to overfitting is that the real line usually reports the resolution uh, during the classification stage. Uh, so at that stage, you can see whether the program are using um, too much of the signal to classify particles. So that's one way to, to help you decide uh, which T value you'd like to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what, what is the optimization step on MSP recon reconstitution that you have done? What is the best ratio in the different projects and which lipids did you use? Um, for nanodisc reconstitution, um, it's, I think it's probably protein dependent. I know in our lab, we work on several proteins uh, and uh, each protein have a different ratio between the, the protein, MSP, as well as the limpid. So that's something that needs to be optimized. Um, but the general principle is that you want to ensure that you have excess MSP and the limpid. Uh, such that you don't lose your protein during the reconstitution process. Um, yeah, I think that's that's my experience. Okay, uh, a question: Why did you go to PNCC to collect data? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, <laughs> it's just my PI uh, asked me to write an application, so yeah, it's not my decision. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it worked. Okay, uh, I just want to clarify, uh, again, this is a question of someone, I uh, wanted to clarify for the for the PAC, you subtracted the extracellular domain, as in you classify just what was left, the micelle and the transmembrane domain, and did you find that this method specifically increased the resolution of the transmembrane domain? Um, when you say subtracted the extracellular domain, that means you that you that you got rid of the extracellular, dom the, yeah, extracellular domain, you got rid of it and, and classified on the rest, or you subtracted uh, the other way around, subtracted myself. Oh, yeah. and, yeah, I'm, I'm using the, the new convention in, since Reline 3.1. So, the, so the, the signal that, that will be used for classification is the one inside the mask. So, so I'm using the extracellular domain as part of the transmembrane domain for classification. So I'm not using the, yeah, the other part. Yeah, so that uh, actually, I think it helps because the resolution wise, it's, uh, it's much better. I moved from 4.2 angstrom all the way to um, uh, close to 3.2 angstrom. So, so yeah, I think it's getting improved. Yeah, for even for out, outside the, the subtracted area. Okay. Uh, can you please explain more why using a subset improves the final resolution? Um, but uh, what what do you think the reason is um, that basically you're just getting rid of bad bad, bad particles? I, I guess that's what that means. Yes, I think that's um, primarily the reason. Um, um, the I think for the packed protein, uh, it's the um, it's very hard to tell uh, good particles and the bad particles um, um, just by looking the um, at the at the two D or or if the classification is inefficient, then sometimes you can make um, wrong judgment. Uh, so that's just something we find that although the, the classes, um, they look similar, but the resolution wise, they, um, they, they actually improve the resolution. Um, if I only use a subset, uh, I actually don't have a very good explanation why that is the case, but I think it could be that that's, that's the way how the classification works um, because um, those uh, several extensive rounds of classification uh, helps to 
help me better separate on those not so good versus the very good particles. Yeah, that might be the reason. Okay. And Can I, I interrupt for just ahead, a second? Ahead. I know we have a number of questions still. Um, yeah. And uh, we are coming up on time, so we'll take a couple of more questions, but we will keep the rest of the questions. And Cheng, if it's okay with you, I'll forward them to you and you can send answers that we can post along with the recording um, after the talk. So uh, we'll, we'll send out that link to everyone and make sure your, your questions do get answered. Um, but while we're here live, we'll just take a couple more so that we finish on the hour. Okay, Thanks. just stop me when, stop me when, uh, when I, hit the last question, okay? <laughs> um, okay, can you uh, comment on low-pass filtering? Uh, let's see. Oh, can you comment on your low-pass filtering between your 3D refinements and the 3D classification again? Uh, how, do you think it how do you think it improved the resolution? Uh... So so you, so you low-pass filtered to 50 and then to seven and uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess that's the part of the question. Yes, I think the, um, so I, so the, so I primarily judge whether the classification works is judged by the final refinement reconstruction. So that's the gold standard. Um, but, uh, but because, so the PET protein is a relatively small protein with not much features. So during the classification, I want to, um, the idea is to give enough information um, um, such that the, the classification process can work more efficiently. So that's why in the last round of classification, I uh, want to give more information. For example, I enforce uh, threefold symmetry uh, so that I will get more particles that looks more like this. Uh, more symmetric particles. And also I um, low pass filter the reference to seven angstrom. And the reason is that at that resolution range, the um, alpha helix uh, feature in the transmembrane domain is, is visible in the reference map. So that is, I think it's going to help uh, for the program to align that part because the transmembrane domain, it's, it's very challenging to align. The, the number of helixes is less and they could be flexible. So by giving that information, it could um, uh, further help the classification algorithm to work and uh, identify a nice uh, particle set for me to further, to move forward. Yeah, so that's the idea. Okay, um, and you, here's, here's a question involving masking and resolution, which, which sometimes is a problem. You showed the resolutions of different refinements, but did you use the same mask when you were comparing these results, especially for the results with and without the mask? So masking versus resolution. Um, so, um, I think um, in general, I create a mask um, at the beginning when I when I first I first refine the particles without mask, and then I uh, generate a mask based on the, the map, and then I use that mask uh, until the end of the data processing. So I don't change the mask; the mask remains the same. Uh, so the only thing that I do is at the end, let's say I've I think I exhaust all the options. Then I fine tune the mask to, to identify the best cutoff for me to calculate the resolution more accurately. So if, if it's the resolution reported in the middle, then that they, they, they were using the same mask. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So that will be our last question live. Um, so thank you so much, Jang, for that awesome talk and fielding so many questions. And we're going to send a few more to you and we will we will post those answers out and, and send people a, a link to that as well. Um, and um, we um, thank you all for joining us today and wish you well on your cryoEM endeavors. Uh, we do have another membrane protein talk next month. So uh, you can find the registration link at cryoemcenters.org and join us again um, next month. And um, do let us at the National Centers know how we can help you. And we will see you next month. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Thanks again. <laughs>